Hello, everyone. I'm Terry Moran. Thanks for streaming with us. President Biden is speaking on the phone with Chinese President Xi Jinping this morning to discuss several issues, including Russia's escalating war against Ukraine. This call marks the first time the two leaders have spoken since the conflict in Ukraine began, and it comes as the U.S. is warning China not to help Russia's war effort. Meanwhile, in Moscow, Vladimir Putin today spoke at a packed stadium concert, a huge event marking eight years since Russia's annexation of Crimea, that territory that Russia seized from Ukraine in 2014. Among other, among other things, Putin repeated his false claim that his invasion of Ukraine is needed to stop what he calls a genocide in the country's southeastern region called Donbass. Meanwhile, Russia's launched another attack in western Ukraine, right on NATO's doorstep. The mayor of Lviv, near the Poland border, says Russian missiles hit an aircraft repair plant close to the city's airport this morning. Senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel has more from the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv. As Russia expands its attacks with that missile strike near the western city of Lviv, the onslaught of Russian bombardment in Kyiv continues again today. Firefighters battling a blaze in an apartment building struck by a missile. Every morning in the capital has started like this this week. The city's mayor posting a video from the rubble pointing out the destruction where one person died and 19 were injured, including four children. And in besieged Mariupol, authorities are searching for survivors after that attack on a theatre there, where as many as a thousand civilians were believed to be sheltering. So far, only 130 people have been confirmed rescued from the site, while hundreds remain missing. These images, released by the Azov Battalion, a far-right paramilitary group now part of the Ukrainian National Guard. While some residents have managed to escape the besieged city, there are up to 250,000 civilians still trapped there. Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, has been mercilessly shelled since the start of this war. A market was hit by a Russian missile, another civilian target. And we're now learning that 68-year-old James Whitney Hill, an American citizen, was among the dead in a Russian artillery strike in Chernihiv in the north. A senior U.S. official telling ABC News they believe Putin's become isolated and is now prone to anger. With a Russian military advance stalled throughout the country, they've switched tactics using long-range missile systems from within Russia. President Biden saying Western allies are united against Putin. A murderous dictator. A pure thug who is waging an immoral war against the people of Ukraine. Secretary of State Blinken saying the Russians are committing war crimes and may go even further. We believe that Moscow may be setting the stage to use a chemical weapon and then falsely blame Ukraine to justify escalating its attacks on the Ukrainian people. U.S. officials believe Ukrainian President Zelensky remains in great danger, but he's repeatedly refused to leave his people behind. Even though hospitals are now being targeted, Zelensky visited a family, wounded as they tried to escape in their car. <laughs> the walls reached everyone here, even the most vulnerable. We visited a shelter for babies born to surrogate mothers cared for by eight extraordinary nurses. Incredible scenes in this basement. There are 20 babies sheltering essentially from the war, waiting for parents to try and brave the battles coming from around the world, including America, to try and collect their kids. And in the meantime, they're down here underground hiding from the war. Yeah, Terry, I think we've had some worrying remarks by the Russians this morning. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov saying any weapons shipments coming in to help the Ukrainian military will be considered legitimate targets, although he's unclear as to whether that means just on Ukrainian territory or on the territory of, say, Poland, those NATO allies of the United States. But it's worth remembering that those routes used for military aid coming in are also used for humanitarian aid, crucial food supplies, and also they're used by those hundreds of thousands of civilians trying to flee the conflict. But it feels this morning like we've entered this new, far more dangerous phase in this conflict. Terry? It sure does. Ian Panel there in Kiev. Thanks very much for that. And as we mentioned, your concerns about safety are growing now in the city of Lviv out in western Ukraine after Russia launched missile strikes there. That city has, for the most part, been spared, seen as a safe haven in Ukraine. Uh, and Russia's bombardment during this war has been mostly elsewhere. ABC News foreign correspondent Maggie Rooley 
joins me now live from Lviv, from the town square there. And Maggie, you know, what's the latest about these strikes? How is it impacting that city? Hey, Terry, yeah, this is sort of an everyone's biggest fear since this war began. Almost not a when, but, you know, if they would strike Lviv. Now we know Russians have attacked Lviv here in western Ukraine. Missile strikes on that uh, building at the airport not too far from us in the city center, just four miles away. You know, Terry, it was close enough that one of our producers was even able to, to see smoke rising from that air. I got a video of it this morning from hell room. Now, the other big concern, Terry, not just how close it is to us here in Lviv, but also how close it is to the Polish border, just 50 miles from Poland, a NATO country. We've talked about this so much, Terry, but it gets closer and closer as this war inches towards NATO countries. The big question is, how long can America and other countries in Europe stay without troops on the ground here? You know, uh, as this war goes further west, I think America is going to have to ask themselves uh, when or if they get involved. Well, President Biden has been scrupulous about that. He says, you know, that we are not going to get involved mm. with a war with Russia. But it's clearly perhaps even in Russia's interest at this point to, to try to drag mm. NATO into it, although they're having mm. to get their hands full with the Ukrainians. Maggie, I'm, I'm seeing you there on the square with those strollers behind you. Well, what's going on there? Yeah, Terry, I know you've been here in Lviv. You've been in this square, such a beautiful city. And uh, now it's been taken over by this protest. You can count them, 109 strollers. There is one behind me, Terry, for every single person that Ukrainians say, every single child that has died in this war so far. Uh, it's a protest reminding people that children are dying. The mayor was just here moments ago calling these strollers uh, empty little angels. They're asking to close the sky. We have heard this so much, Terry. President Zelensky asked him to close this guy, local officials asking now, the people here in Lviv asking this as well. And Terry, you know, I have to say it's emotional in this square. You know how lively this city is to see this, this protest and demonstration of 109 lost babies behind me, uh, just beyond it. You might be able to even hear them a bit. You hear children sort of yelling in joy. There's a man uh, blowing bubbles and getting the kids all exciting and having that next to each other, reminding you of the joy of childhood and then the 109 childhoods that have been lost. It, it's emotional today, Terry. It, it really is just uh, just seeing that it is an eloquent statement there. And Maggie, there you are in Lviv. A lot of embassies and businesses and journalist yeah. organizations have left Kiev because it is really the main target of the Russian uh, advance and centered in Lviv. What does this mean for all of that and all of that work that is being done, humanitarian organizations as well? Yeah, Terry, it's such a good question. I think one many people are asking this morning. You mentioned uh, journalists. I think every major network around the world has people stationed here right now. Uh, so many humanitarian organizations. We talked to the Red Cross, UNICEF, Samaritan's Purse. They are all here working right now. We know that hundreds of thousands of displaced people and refugees come through this city now every single day. So there is such a need. And as this war moves west, as Lviv becomes a target, the question is what's going to happen to all of them? Will these humanitarian aid uh, be able to stay in this city? What's going to happen to the refugees that have already fled once? Will they have to flee again? Terry, it is such a major concern. I have to tell you, walking around the streets here in Lviv, I think everyone's conversation has been mentioning this explosion. So there is a fear here right now, Terry. Mm, understandably. Maggie Ruley in Ukraine. Stay safe, my friend. Thanks very much. Well, meanwhile, as we said, uh, really the big headline here in Washington, President Biden speaking with uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping. This call has just completed, we understand. It's been a long one. This is the first time these two leaders have spoken since Russia invaded Ukraine. A critical call at a critical moment. So let's bring in White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks along with ABC's Alex Perche in Washington for more. So Mary Alice, what can you tell us? Yeah, like you said, a long call, Terry, nearly two hours. We haven't had a formal readout from the White House yet, but we're starting to get some word actually from the Chinese president and his team. And I have to say, I'm a little bit surprised by this language. It would suggest that uh, the call went well from the United States perspective, at least. This initial readout from the Chinese saying the Ukraine crisis is something we don't want to see. Relevant events once again show us that state-to-state -state relations cannot go to the point of confrontation, conflict and confrontation 
location are not in anyone's interest. So far, the United States has been so frustrated with China's uh, unwillingness to formally condemn uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine. And then this part is also interesting in the statement, uh, China writing, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council and the world's two largest economies, we must not only lead the development of China-U.S. relations on the right track, but shoulder our due international responsibilities and make efforts for world peace. Now, of course, uh, actions speak a lot louder than words. The United States will be looking so closely to see what China actually does in the coming days and weeks. But I would imagine that the United States uh, will feel good about this statement. At least it seems like China was taking notice of what the United States had to say. Well, it, it, it sounds good, but as you say, the rubber meets the road in their actions, and a lot of that verbiage is just kind of feel good, uh, please stop the war stuff. And, and the question still remains, would they hold, uh, would they hold, would the United States hold China accountable if China does choose to help Russia? That's really the big question here. And how does the United States do that? I, I know that Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned China that there would be costs imposed if China answers Russia's request for military aid. What would that look like? Yeah, that's a million dollar question, Terry. The White House has not said what it would look like. They've talked about these consequences, but they not, have not specified what those consequences would be. Of course, it's hard to imagine the West uniting and lobbying sanctions against China like they did against Russia. But when they they talk about options on the table, it's most likely economic punishments. That's what we imagine. But of course, uh, the United States is not only worried that China might help out Russia economically, help them avoid the pain of these sanctions that they are dealing with, but they've been very worried that China would also contribute militarily. And then it raises the question, uh, is there some other way to respond to China besides more sanctions? Yeah, that is a hard problem. And we'll see what comes out of this call in addition to that language that you read us. Mary Alice, thanks for that. Now, in, in New York, the United Nations Security Council is holding a, media, a meeting, a meeting called by Russia at the United Nations Security Council to discuss you know, what Russia says is chemical and biological weapons that might be deployed by Ukraine. There's, uh, the United States government says there's no evidence. There's another false claim uh, that the Russians have made. The U.S. ambassador to the United Nations spoke out ahead of that meeting. Let's listen to her. This meeting and these lies are designed for one purpose and one purpose alone deflect responsibility for Russia's war of choice and the humanitarian catastrophe it has caused. All right, let's go to Alex Perchet now. Alex, President Biden has also warned uh, that Russia would pay a severe price if it uses chemical weapons in Ukraine. Now, that, that's a question, because while President Biden has said, you know, every inch of NATO territory will be, will be defended, but there will be no U.S. boot on the ground in Ukraine, what is the American uh, response? What kind of consequences would there be if, as the Pentagon fears, Russia deploys and uses chemical weapons? Well, uh, Terry, we saw uh, the, the White House kind of telegraph and get the ball rolling on this uh, earlier this week and, and a little bit last week. Uh, but uh, the House voting to suspend normal trade relations with Russia and Belarus, which allows uh, the, the, the president to impose higher tariffs uh, or more tariffs on uh, Russian and, and, and Belarusian uh, exports. And this is something that, uh, that, that ha happened yesterday. It also gives the president the ability to uh, specifically levy sanctions uh, against individuals that support either Russia or these Belarusian uh, aggressions against Ukraine. And, and something else that was interesting from that pre buttle if you will, from uh, uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield is she brought up that uh, she chastised Russia for abusing its position in the big five, saying that it must be said that Russia is abusing its responsibilities and privileges as a permanent member of of the Security Council. Again, as you mentioned, this was a meeting that Russia uh, called uh, to basically lay out these uh, unfounded claims about Ukraine and the U.S. Russia scrapped its plans to call for a vote at this meeting, but still uh, the U.S. didn't object to try to, uh, to, to have, it, uh, have it postponed or canceled. Linda Thomas-Greenfield having this pre and putting out their position very strongly.
That's, a, that's an interesting point. There have been calls that Russia should be removed from the Security Council, which was established to make sure that no great power just conquered another country, as what has happened in World War II. Uh, that's probably not likely, but it is an interesting scene up there. Alex Perche and Mary Alice Parks, thanks very much for that. And meanwhile, the refugee crisis could grow even worse as Russia expands its attacks in Ukraine. Civilians who once found the city of Lviv to be a safe haven, as we were talking about, uh, may now make their way across the border. And the U.N. estimates that Poland's already taken in more than half of the three million refugees who have fled Ukraine so far. ABC's Inez de la Quatera joins me live now from Poland, right near the Ukrainian border. And as you've been there for a while, uh, over two million refugees have now fled to Poland. How, how, was, how, was, how are people talking about how this attack on Lviv across the border could impact the flow of refugees into an already burdened Poland? Hey, Terry. Yeah, so we are at the Medica border crossing here. This is where so many refugees are taking their first steps into Poland. They're crossing the border back there. Then they're being greeted by rows and rows of tents where they're offered food, water, medical assistance if they need it. In this case, they're also lining up here to get onto buses to other parts of Poland and other parts of Europe. But like you say, this comes as we learn that Poland has now taken in 2 million refugees. Uh, 3.1 million refugees total have now left Ukraine. 2 million of them coming here to Poland. And it as that number continues to increase, as we're seeing Russia targeting the western part of the country, there are concerns that more and more refugees could continue to come here to Poland and overwhelm Poland. All right, and uh, Inez, there on the border, seeing that exodus from Poland, thank you very much for that report. So I'm Terry Moran, uh, but stay with us because Diane Macedo is going to be back after this with today's top headline. Welcome back to ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo. Evacuation orders are in place across several parts of central Texas as crews work to contain wildfires. The fires are being fueled by winds and dry conditions. They've already burned through more than 38,000 acres. Monday marks the beginning of confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominee Katanji Brown Jackson. Judge Jackson has met with 44 senators ahead of those hearings. If confirmed, she'll be the first black woman to ever serve on the nation's highest court. We will bring you live coverage of the hearings starting Monday morning. And coming up, it is World Sleep Day. We have a sleep doctor in the house to break down what you need to know to get that much needed shut eye. Stay with us. Welcome back and a happy World Sleep Day to you. This unofficial holiday is aimed at raising awareness about sleep issues and this year it comes just two days after the Senate passed a bill that could affect all of our sleep. So let's bring in sleep neurologist Dr. Chris Winter, author of The Rested Child, Why Your Tired, Wired or Irritable Child May Have a Sleep Disorder and how to help. Dr. Winter, thanks so much for taking the time to come on today. I want to start with the Sunshine Act because this week the Senate unanimously voted to keep daylight saving time year round. And many sleep experts have very forcefully come out against this. So can you explain why that is and what's your take? Good morning, Diane. Happy Sleep Day and congratulations on your book and being such a great voice and advocate for sleep. Yeah, so we have been sort of fighting for the uh, riddance of daylight savings time for a long time. You know, having this artificial every six months, everybody has to adjust by an hour is, is really sort of unnecessary. So it's great that Congress is looking into this and is making changes. I think a lot of people in my community were hopeful that we would stay with standard time and not daylight saving time, simply because it creates more light in the morning, which is probably healthier for sleep and for mood. Yeah, I know those darker mornings and brighter evenings can confuse the circadian rhythm a little bit. Um, but what do you think is the biggest problem with the way most people think about sleep? Yeah, I think the biggest problem is that we focus so much on individuals who quote unquote can't fall asleep. And that's a phrase I would love to eliminate from the English language. And, and a lot less on people who sleep 
soundly and, and strongly. People who might come over to your house like your dad and sits down on the couch and immediately falls asleep or all the people in church with you that are falling asleep in the pews. Sometimes those individuals feel like they're great sleepers because they can you know sleep anywhere. And so I feel like we should put more focus on hypersomnia in this country and maybe a little bit less on the individuals who struggle a little bit to fall asleep at night. Well, and that takes me to my next point, because in my book, The Sleep Fix, one of the first things I point out is the difference between insomnia and sleep deprivation. And you were one of the first people to teach me about this misconception. So can you explain what those terms mean and why it's so important to know the difference? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I really appreciate the way you talk about that in your book, because it's very important to me. And I feel like people need to understand that when you hear a news story about the dangers of sleep deprivation, how it can cause heart disease, cancer, depression, that's not entirely the same thing as insomnia, which is an individual who is not happy with the way he or she is sleeping and feels upset or anxious about that. And so often we think of insomnia and sleep deprivation as synonyms, the same thing, but they're really quite opposite. So we want to treat our insomnia patients in this way, but the people who are sleep deprived in another way. And if you're somebody who struggles to fall asleep at night, I always tell my patients, be excited and take heart because if you're in bed and it's comfortable and it's dark, and you're not falling asleep, that's a pretty good indication that you've gotten some sleep relatively recently. Yeah, and usually if you can relax, then you actually do fall asleep more easily. Now, that's in right. The Rested Child, you take a deep dive on lots of different issues that can affect children's sleep. So do you have a favorite tip for parents who want to ensure their kids are getting enough? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting. There was a study many, many years ago where they would take children into a cafeteria with all kinds of foods, desserts and good vegetables and proteins, and say, you can eat whatever you want. And the researchers found that initially they just ate cake and pie, but eventually they regulated their own sleep. Or, I'm sorry, their own eating. Kids will regulate their own sleep. So what I want for my parents is I want you to set up the, set up the expectation of sleep. I want you to be in your bedroom at this time, but you can read, you can look at baseball cards, you can draw me a picture. I always tell people, let your kids decide when they turn the light out. As long as you're being very disciplined about the wake up time, kids generally regulate themselves and they create a relationship with sleep that's based out of concern for their health and doing the right thing and not out of fear that if somebody catches me awake at night, I get into trouble. So we told our kids, be in your room, stay there unless you smell smoke or see somebody you don't recognize. But in terms of when you want to go to bed, you make that decision. We don't care, but we're going to make sure you wake up at the right time every day. I and that's why it. COVID has been really problematic for a lot of kids. It sure has. So whether it's an adult or a child, how do you know when you can address this at home? And how do you know when it's time to see a sleep specialist and what kind of sleep, uh, specialist to see? It's a great question. I'm, I'm an MD. Um, and so I always think about like an orthopedic uh, doctor. And, you, you know, if you your knee hurt, you might ice it, you might get a knee brace, but eventually you're going to say, I think I'm going to need to go see uh, an orthopedic specialist and you make an appointment to go see her. And she, you know, takes her specialized training and figures out what's wrong with your knee and gets it taken care of. I think people need to understand that there's all kinds of great resources out there for your sleep. But at some point, if you or your child is exhibiting excessive sleepiness or can't sleep, go see a sleep specialist. They're out there. They're waiting for you. All right, Dr. Chris Winter, it's great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diane. Have a great day. You too. Happy World Sleep Day. And thank you for joining us. I'm Diane Macedo. Do stay with us. ABC News Live continues with news, context, and analysis. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.